Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of My EdTech Life. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here with you all today. Thank you so much on this special time that we have. It is a Saturday afternoon, but I hope anywhere that you are around the world, if you're joining us, you're having a wonderful afternoon, an evening, or a very late evening, whatever the case is, it doesn't matter. We thank you for being here, and we really appreciate all of your support. As always, we try and bring you the best of the best each and every Every week with some amazing conversations, amazing educators, amazing creators, with the whole mission of bringing educators and creators together one show at a time. And today I am really excited because we have an amazing and wonderful, genuine, authentic person that I had the pleasure of meeting in person at TCEA this last year. And I am just excited. So many of you are probably recognizing him on the screen. So I'm just really excited to have him here today. And we're going to let him introduce himself. So how are you doing this morning, George? Hey, Fonzie, man, I'm doing great, Fonz. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, it's just amazing to finally re reconnect with you. <laughs> you know, I remember on, on the day you and I met, I was on the way to TCEA. I was at my hotel and it took me a, a little while to find the bus. And I wasn't sure of where I was going and everything. And you were on the bus and you welcomed me and stuff. And so um, I will never, ever forget you. Like if we never get to talk again, which I don't think that's the case, but, you know, I'll never forget you. But I'm doing fine, man. I'm doing great. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. And that was a great honor and pleasure. And like I said, for me, it was really, you know, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, this is George and he's sitting like right there. And and again, it, it's just because of that, the work that you've done, what I've seen you do and, you know, especially what you share out on Twitter, your writing, uh, again, going back to the work that you're doing and it was great to meet you and just so genuine. And I mean, it was great because you were sitting across the aisle and then you came and sat right next to me and we just chatted up a storm. And then we found that, with you know, there was some relative connection as far as geographic areas and, you know, family and that tie to, to Texas and so on. So it was really great to had to have the honor and pleasure of meeting you. And now you get to be a guest on the show. And I'm just really excited to learn from you, not only myself, because honestly, this is my 35 to 45 minute also PD for me that I feel is personalized, but most importantly, those are listeners and our viewers that are joining us today that will also take away some uh, knowledge nuggets from you today as we go through our conversation. So before we get dive deep into the conversation, uh, for many audience members or viewers that may just be getting to know you today for the very first time, George, can you give us a little brief introduction about your, your work, your context in education? Yeah, so I'm an education coach um, first. Um, education coach meaning that I get to work with a variety of educators. Um, sometimes it might be a superintendent, an assistant superintendent, a director, or a principal. And then at times I, I, I get to work with teachers and also students. And I'm a teacher as well. I work at ODU and so I do teach classes. Um, in addition, I'm an author. Um, I've written a few books and I love to write all the time. And so part of my routine is to um, do scholarly service, which means I do write books. Sometimes it's research, but at times it's just, you know, writing for educators that will never get to meet me or ever be in a workshop. And so I like to post those how-to articles on Edutopia or on ISTE and, you know, places where I know that educators will, you know, find it. And then I'm an advocate, meaning that I try to advocate for things in education that I feel are important. And sometimes it might, you know, take me to Washington where I'll speak with um, someone that um, is a senator or um, a congressperson and just explain things that educators need and then show evidence of what educators are doing with ed tech, with instructional strategies um, and with funding. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that description. And again, 
definitely writing, you know, that's one of the things that, that that's where I first got introduced to your work was through the writing that you're doing. And of course, articles through Edutopia. And I will be sharing those links there because Edutopia does have, you know, a profile page with all the articles that you've written. And of course, we'll be sharing the links on how people can get in contact with you through the show notes and along the show. But thank you so much. Uh, now, George, today, I also I love to get to know the origin story. And I know we kind of warmed up a little pre chat and a couple of days back. But, you know, people that are on the show, I really love to hear here, where it is just a little bit of their background and how they came into education and how they've continued to do their work. And then we'll get into today, just which is being uh, very innovative and the instructional innovation for personal and professional growth. But uh, if you can just tell us a little bit, I'm always curious, where <laughs> did your love for education come from? Well, I think that my love for education, uh, I mean, came from um, um, from teachers I had in elementary. And so I lived in a household where education was important, but it was important more in name. Like, like you know, it's something that we respected to do, but not necessarily shown how all of the time. And so I had teachers that would drive in from the um, suburbs and they would basically, you know, they showed us a lot of love, a lot of attention. Like, I do remember that. Like, I lived in, I'm in mean, Queens, New York. I'm in Rockaway. And I remember that they paid a lot of attention to our reading, writing, and math skills. And so because of that, I was always academically inclined, even as a little kid. And that really helped me a lot um, in middle school, high school, and in college. But education was not my first um, um, choice. I was, my major was in computer science and in business. It was called management information systems. That's why you'll see that a lot of my early work and once in a while, like in December, like when the hour of code is coming and um, CS Ed Week is around, I will post an article or two about computer science. But all of my early work, a lot of it is computer science um, and also um, um, PBL. And that's because that's what my undergrad was in and a lot of the internships and the work that I was I mean, doing in college. And so I remember when I started programming, I would do internships and I started realizing that I'm more of a people person and this is not really my thing, like, you know, being in a computer all day, even though I enjoyed the work, but I didn't have a lot of um, social interaction. And so then I tried networking and that, you know, took me in, in, into Manhattan, I'm um, in the city of New York. And I got to, you know, going to offices. But again, after I spoke with the I mean, a project manager or wh whoever the I mean, a boss was, I would end up again alone, you know, troubleshooting and, you know, working on my own, which I didn't like that. And so I had an auntie that um, passed away. And I walked into her house one day and I was talking about my work, right? And she said to me, you would make a great teacher. And she was a teacher. And so I said to her, so why do you say that? And she said, because you have a unique way of explaining things in a way that people really understand you. And so I resisted that for a long time, but she said to me, look, why don't you try a summer school job as a computer teacher? You know, back then, like think back 01, 02, right? You know, that's what people like would, you know, call it. And so I really resisted, but something told me that I should try it out when she told me that the pay was $36.50 an hour for five hours a day, four days a week. And so I did the math. It was like $700 a week, which back then that was a lot of money for me. And so I, I tried it. And I remember I was really, really nervous and everything. And something really like two things happened. When I got up in front of the kids and I looked at everyone, something inside of me said, you were born to do this. I, I can't describe it, but I was so nervous. I will never ever forget the anxiety and how my heart was racing as I walked from the car into the office. And it never happened again where I was, you know, greeted as a teacher by the office staff in such a nice way. But on that day I did. 
And, you know, it just happened. And then the um, second reason was we had talked about having a chip on your shoulder, right? Like you and I talked about that. And so one of the things that I always felt as a youngster and as a young adult was that I wish that my parents would have been better friends, you know, to me as, as, as I grew up. And when I got into the classroom and I started to meet other young people and got to see some of the things that they went through, it made me realize that I was neglected, right? You know, from, you know, time to time, but I didn't really experience some of the traumas that other kids went through. And so I wanted to help and, and, and to be a positive influence and, and a role model. And so I decided after that, after meeting those, you know, 25 kids that I would want to be a teacher, even though that's not what I had really planned. Hey, and you know what, sometimes things happen that way, George, that, you know, you don't really plan and in a similar situation, you know, there was a pivot point also in my career and, you know, going from marketing and falling into education as a second option, but just falling in love with it. And and I know our audience members hear that all the time, but I genuinely, it, it was like, this was what I was meant to be, even though my goals were go to business school, become a businessman and just be rolling around in my money all the time and, you know, <laughs> buying, buying my parents everything that I didn't have and what I wish I had and what the, I wish they had. But, you know, there, there came that moment and been in education now for 16 years and I'm loving every bit of it and just that growth process. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about how we can tie uh, you know, the the instructional models for instructional innovation, but also let it be personal growth as well for us. So that's kind of what I, I want to get into, because I know that there's a, an Edutopia article here that, and I did put the link for the Edutopia, actually your profile and all your articles pop up, but mainly this, uh, it says a five-step coaching model for instructional innovation. But as I was reading this article and just really, you know, refreshing myself with this article, I was like, man, th there's a lot here to glean, not only in the classroom sense and in the education sense, but into the personal, you know, space as well. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about that. You know, you're, you're in the classroom and obviously now you're doing classes at Old Dominion and, you know, you've grown into being, a, you know, an instructor there and different various roles as you've moved up. Tell us a little bit about, as we get into this, because I, I would love for you to tie that in, just that growth that you saw. When did you know that it was time to grow and just continue to move forward in your career as a professional? Um, so like, like you mean as an education coach, like having a business or, or do you, well, mean like from the classroom to, you know, oh, moving oh, out yeah. of the district and then, yeah. And then leading oh, up okay, into gotcha, gotcha, this gotcha. role. Yeah. 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 So my, um, master's program was in school administration and supervision. And so I had never had, you know, financial stability in my life as a kid. Right. Um, and so that was something that I was looking forward to as, um, as a young adult. And when I became a teacher, like, like, you know, people said that, well, you should become an administrator. And so I thought that that was like, 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 you know, the key to that. And so, you know, but not knowing what, what I know now, obviously, and not having, um, a mentor at the time in education. And so I remember I, I did a master's program. And I did an internship as a principal um, in summer school. And it was there that I realized that it shouldn't be about, you know, money. It should be about what doing something that you are good at and that, and, and that you're passionate. And so I just realized that I didn't want to do cafeteria duty and, you know, bus duty and, you know, referrals and, you know, stuff like that. And so I decided that I would stay in the classroom. And so I did my internship. I graduated. I got the admin license, but I didn't really plan on ever using it. And then I got invited to 
apply to a job in central office for um, STEM and computer science as, as a curriculum specialist. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that because I felt like it was like, you know, more of that same thing, right? Like, I just want to stay in the classroom. And I kept on being asked over and over again. And so I started to think about it. Right now, I teach 150 kids each year. So I'm impacting 150 kids. If I take a, a central office job, I now have 40 teachers. And most likely, they'll also have 150 kids. So if you do that math, I'm like, okay, I can have a bigger impact. And I'm not really worried about all the things that I just said that happened in a building. And so I tried it out. And I, I remember I, I got a mentor, Mr. Browder um, or Jerry. And that was the first mentor I, I ever had. And I remember I went over his house and we had a meeting. And he said to me, you might know your area, but there's a lot more to running a school system. There's a lot more to helping other teachers fine tune and really develop themselves. You have to know what you want them to know. And also there's also politics and you have to be able to manage that as well. And so he said to me, you know, and it was his 50th year in education. And he said, it's going to take you nine years. And I remember in my mind, I was thinking, man, in three years, I'm done with this. And you know something? I stayed in that job for nine years. And I can honestly say that by the eighth year is when I felt extremely, you know, comfortable understanding what is going on. And not just in my area, but in other, in other areas. See, the, the thing about rigor and no one ever explains this, is that rigor means when one piece of learning, right, it ties into another. It's, it's like a cross-cutting concept. One branch of science or one branch of learning, you know, it, it ties into another. And th those are the type of, you know, connections that young people need, but teachers also need. How does literacy and numeracy, right? How does social science, how does scientific inquiry, how does that all really tie in to each other in the real world, but also in the classroom? And so I work at a district where even though I was in charge of the engineering teachers or the STEM teachers, I was also responsible every nine weeks with all the other specialists, math, science, social studies, to you know visit each of the 50 schools in our district. And so I got to see elementary, middle school, high school, and not only see it as a witness, but learn what the spiraling standards are in each of those areas that repeat themselves each year and how they connect into electives and then be able to know and learn our teachers so we can personalize PD for them. And um, I think in the article at the bottom, we got 50 schools accredited in 2010, right? Richmond City Public Schools. And so that was an education that I don't think I would have gotten anywhere in the world, but it's the catalyst for that instructional model that you see in the article, which as you see, step two is doing learning walks, you know, visiting our classrooms. How do you design PD? If you're not first listening to teachers in the classroom with them, right? Like, how do you do that? It doesn't work, right? There's no buy-in and you're really not understanding what the needs are. And so that article um, is written in the context of tier one instruction, because that's really the whole group message and the foundation that every teacher needs, but you can build from there, you know, tier two and, and, and um, tier three, but also other initiatives like project-based learning, like STEM, you know, all of those other things. And so for me, it was just, you know, doing that. And what I've realized is this, and I started with a very small classroom. I did really well with that and I got a bigger one. And then I got 40 classrooms 
And then eventually it's turned into a thing where I started working with 500 educators a year. And then that, as you know, ballooned. I have found that when you do one thing well, even if you're not trying to expand what your reach is, it's just a natural, um, you know, um, movement or um, progression of life. You just have to keep going. <laughs> No, and I love that. I agree with you 100%. And, you know, much of what you said, it, it just, it, it ties into what we currently see. And, and you know, for myself that I work at the district level and see, you know, a little bit of what goes on with curriculum, I think that's something that's very important. But one key observation, I think, is that that step two is something that is very, very important. And maybe not a lot of districts do those things as far as, you know, some of the decisions that are made are made within the silo of that building, but they never really see how they affect once you, you know, integrate that and how it affects the students and teachers in that, in their classrooms, you know, and oftentimes we see that, that disconnect. Well, so our superintendent at the time was Dr. Yvonne Brandon, and she was at one time our director of CNI. And so she had a very strong background in, in CNI. And for folks listening, that's um, curriculum and instruction. And so one of the things that we were always you know, taught in our district was that this guides the ship. CNI guides the ship. You don't buy any books, any technology. You don't do any partnerships with anyone. You don't bring anyone in. You don't do anything unless it's enhancing curriculum and instruction. And so the thing that I have seen is that if you don't really understand curriculum and instruction, and what I mean by that are pedagogical strategies for mapping a curriculum, unpacking it, knowing each day what I'm going to do, and then ha how to facilitate it, then how can you be strong in the classroom? How can you take, you know, academic, I mean, you know, goals that your state or, or your district or your school has set if you can't, you know, plan for it and then learn how to teach it? And so I'd say that that is my biggest um, it was a gift to me because I was able to take that knowledge and you'll see in the five steps that's in the article and basically it's action research, right? So in the article, like we are speaking about tier one instruction, but that's just a topic. That's one, that's one instructional innovation, but the steps are action research. You basically take like if you want to do, I mean, a tier one STEM or, you know, whatever, all you have to do is do some research and find out, well, what's been done. And there's got to be a framework or a model or, you know, something like that. And then you take that and then, and then say, okay, well, here's what the research says. Then you write a problem statement, right? You want to write down where you are, where you want to go and how you think that you will get there. Boom, you start right there. And then you go in the classrooms and see what's going on. And a lot of times you'll realize, well, where we want to go, we can't get there yet because we don't understand how to plan effectively and then how to facilitate effectively. For example, you know, learning is driven or instruction is driven by assessment. But assessment needs learning goals. So the learning goal has to be very clearly articulated, not just on the board, but in the mini lesson each day. It's got to be the basis of the conversation between the teacher and the child. And so therefore, whatever work time is happening, whatever they're working on has to be the follow through of the learning goal. If you don't see that in the classroom, then that means that there's a gap of knowledge there. So now we have to address that before we can talk about STEM and other things like that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so once we get that, you know, knowledge and we take a teaching team that has some instructional leaders, but also has teachers, you can't, you really shouldn't make any decisions about teachers. If you don't have them in the room, there's gotta be some sort of representation 
because it's not just about seeing what they're doing. It's about hearing what the roadblocks are, what we don't understand about the kids. The biggest experts of the kids are the teachers, not anyone else, right? And so here's the thing. Once we sit down as a, as a teaching team, and I might be the thought partner in, in this situation, I have some knowledge, but everyone in the room also has some knowledge. We take that data, we look at, at the glows. What are the good things, right? Because you don't want to replace a system with another system, you know, per se. You want to take what's there and you want to make it better. And so once everyone is seeing, seeing and saying the same thing, then we start to, you know, develop what, what the treatment is. And a lot of times we'll realize that what the original problem statement was, we got to go back and fix that first. And then we have to really look at what are the behaviors? What are the outcomes that we want to see? What is it that we want to work on now for our context? Right? Our context. Every context is different. And then we start with our PD. And PD should be in strands. There's the admin strand. There's the BT or the you know beginning teacher. And then the seasoned teacher. And then sometimes you got to work on a lot of different things, but you can't do it in one year, three, five, seven. So what you do there is you make milestones. And so that is the um, type of thing that I learned early on. And I'm a coach that I'm coaching almost every week, I would say. And so I get to fail forward a lot. And so part of the reason why I write these articles now is because I've always been a big fan of Edutopia. There's a guy named Andrew Miller. Look up Andrew Miller, everyone. He's got like way more articles than anyone I've ever seen. And he has made a career out of being a coach, but just being able to explain things in a way that other educators can, can just follow. It's, it's like a chapter four in a dissertation where you can read the chapter, model what the process and, and, and the um, success is. And so I was very impressed with that. And I didn't have that ability at first to explain it like how Andrew did, but it was a desire in me to help other people that I may never meet. And so as I do my work and I go along, I take time every morning to write it down for someone that may not get to know me. And sometimes it turns into a book and sometimes it, it doesn't, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's what I'm leaving behind. Man, George, this was amazing. I mean, you the the way that you explained it and the way that you took this article, you know, and, and the just the knowledge drops that you gave as far as through your experience. And and of course, this isn't something that was just year one, year two for George, you know, in curriculum. And no, no, no. This is this is years of work. This is years of, you know, studying. This is years of reading. This is years of practice and so on. But the way that you just set this up and and Can you I know, I was, yes, yes, like, go ahead. Like this is 10 to 14 hour days for the past 15 years. That's what that is. And a lot of doors shut in the face in the beginning. What you're seeing now was not always like that. It took a lot of that. And so I'm saying that not for sympathy, but for empathy for anyone that is trying to make a change in education or is trying to you know, be a coach is to, you can't look online on social media and think you know someone or you think you know their story. You know, that's what I was, I'm so intrigued about you, um, especially with um, the origin story of a person. I think that if you get to know a person's story, you kind of realize there's a lot that went into that. Like, like it wasn't one, two, three. And so that is like the, you know, message that I'm trying to say here today. 
that article so there's a lot of different articles on there and they have all like you know different topics but that action research that's actually how knowledge is created and so that's the actual you know like i get schools that have read that and they'll be like man that's what we needed but then i get some schools and say hey can you walk us through that like can we do that um a few times and so that's really what it's all about is whatever you're you know doing how are we making education better and so i think that if we can explain our work right what's very difficult but in a more simple way i think that we can leave a mark and maybe spark the brain of a person that will take something way further than we can ever imagine. All right. Hey, George, I, I know uh, we kind of had uh, something going on here, but I, I do always like to take questions from the audience. And, and John sure has been that. here from the beginning. And John is asking here, he would love to hear your thoughts on the current state of teachers being completely overwhelmed and worn out, as well as many leaving the profession. You know, what are your thoughts on that currently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I so I have a podcast, um, SEL in Action, and we just wrapped that up, and we did an entire um, um, episode on that. And I don't have an answer of for a teacher that it's at their breaking point. I mean, think about it, right? Just think about this. A lot of our teachers feel that they're being blamed for everything in education. You know, salaries don't match the hours put in or the work put in, you know, the hours after school, having to, you know, plan instruction, you know, grade papers, all of these different things, right? Then they have to worry about all the paperwork, all of the testing, brand new initiatives, you know, um, teaching in a pandemic, unruly students, at times angry parents, right? So I don't have the answer for, for a teacher that's experiencing that. Why? Because there is no right answer to that. Someone has to, at some point, figure out what is too much and what they, what they can or you know, can't do. And they have to figure out for, for, for themselves exactly how it is that, how they have to take um, care of themselves. But for the administrators, um, I do have a couple of things that I do want to say. And so I, um, I keynoted for the superintendents in my state about three weeks ago. And one of the things that I asked them was this. Why do people become teachers? If we are going to be supporting teachers, this is something we have to ask ourselves. And so everyone gave a lot of different reasons. They want to make a difference. They, they love young people, all of these different things. And so I, I brought up the why teach survey in 2015, which some teachers were, you know, surveyed and the top reason why well, there's two top reasons that were a tie for number one. And one was wanting to make a difference in the life of young people. But the other was because they felt that they would be good at it. And it's like, it was like, wow. Okay, so here's the second question. Why do people stay in education? And the top reason, according to that survey, was because they feel that they are good at their job. So backing up, I'm an administrator. I'm delivering all of, all of the workload. I'm telling them what they need to do, all of these things. If a kid's in trouble, either I can support or I can't, you know, all these different things. We have to look at the confidence and self-efficacy of our teachers and think about that as we start to put the workflow through. If we don't do that, then if confidence and self-efficacy that I can do my job is the main reason why someone stays in a job, right? And right now, education is the most stressful in a profession, according to the RAND survey, 
of 2021, then anything that challenges that self-efficacy and that confidence, whether it's a new initiative, whether it's increased workload, this testing, whatever it is, you know, pressure buzz pipes. And so I think that, I mean, it's coming. I mean, there's education will, in my opinion, and I, you know, I don't know, but I think it, there would be a big reform coming soon. I mean, it's got to be like if so many of our educators are leaving, right, we have to listen. And so the one thing that I told them is that what my 15 years of doing learning walks, being in classrooms, looking at instruction, listening to educators, resoundingly, I've seen five things that a person would need in order to feel very confident in what they do. Number one is have a way to manage our difficult emotions. It's okay not to be okay when things don't really go right, but you, but it's not okay not to have a way out of that. You have to manage that, that's the first thing. But the second thing is we need like a chef, right? Like a chef or a mechanic, they have a protocol or a tool or a recipe for whatever they have to do. Educators need a trusted set of pedagogical strategies for planning and for facilitating. And so if we provide our teachers, right, you know, systematic approaches, and I'm talking about the ones that are career switchers, fresh out of college, right, that need this, because not every educator needs this, but the ones that, you know, do. If we provide them systematic approaches to planning and some high yielding five to six high yielding strategies for really um, taking what they've written down or what they've mapped and now how to teach it. And then we, well, what will happen is this, when something happens that disrupts instruction, because they have these little recipes and these frameworks and these tools, they'll be able to know how to stop and pivot and do what they have to do and then get back. But then also they need two more things, a way to monitor student learning, a systematic approach for that, and also a way to monitor the impact of their own teaching. And those are the five things I've seen, just this is what my data tells me of being in classrooms, working with educators that we need to, in my opinion, help our teachers with in order for them to, or us to feel more um, you know, confident and have the self-efficacy. Now, the other issues that I described in the beginning, when someone's at that, at, at that breaking point and upset, I don't have an answer for that. Like, I, like I'd be lying and say, well, I know what to, no, like I don't know what to do. Um, I'm trying to, to help other people not get to that point, but I think it's out of our hands. I think that educators are realizing that a lot of the systems are broken and they haven't been working. And now we know it doesn't work or we know it's not working and we know that it's not our fault. Great, so great. I'm not sure if that answers the, you know, the um, question, but you asked it. <laughs> yeah, no, George, that was amazing. And I thank you. And thank you, John, for joining us uh, out of here, Temple, Texas, I believe. And then I want to thank my uh, colleague also, uh, or actually one of my classmates, Luis uh, Boca Negra, who is also joining us here. Luis is in the doctoral program with me. And he says, stories are crucial and build strong connections, which prepare a good foundation for coaching. So thank you, Luis. Thank you, John, for participating in the chat. And uh, so, George, just to kind of start, you know, kind of wrapping up a little bit because of this article and everything that you've talked about as far as uh, the innovation and this model that really ties in to obviously education. But, you know, along this process, uh, along your talk and everything that, that you were sharing, I was like really seeing that connection too to that personal and that personal component, <laughs> that professional growth, honestly, because I'm always looking because, you know, at myself as, as I like to consider myself or at least 
think of myself as a, an education leader in the sense of always being trying to find and learn and learn more and learn more and add it to my practice. But this also helps in that personal growth where I'm like, yes, this is these are things that I'm currently doing, you know, per personally and professionally. But for yourself, I, in, in hearing your story, I can really see that connection in how you grew within your district. And now you've grown into this next step of, or this next iteration of George Valenzuela as a coach, as an instructor at Old Dominion, and as somebody who is keynoting and sharing this knowledge now. So just real quick, uh, as we kind of wrap up, you know, that transition from, you know, district to your coaching business and, and, and to business, tell us a little bit about that and what sparked that, that change. Um, well, I never planned to have my own business. Like that wasn't something that I was really interested in doing. I knew that I wanted to help education. And if I was a, you know, consultant and I would consult for, for a company that is well known and that can, um, help me learn how to become a coach, then I was happy with that. And even that when I joined Buck Institute, it was never to be a national coach. It was for me to learn how to help the 40 teachers in my district. When I was working with my 40 teachers, I realized very quickly that we, we were asking our teachers to do things that we didn't know how to do ourselves. And so I didn't want to be that you know, type of person. And so I went out and sought my own PD. And so I didn't know that, that I would be put to, you know, work with educators in other states as I was learning, you know, how to do my own thing. And then eventually um, I got good at it. And I was invited by um, a couple of school systems because I was writing a lot and they asked me if I could do some work with them. And so when I reached back out to them, that they were like, we can't do business or we can't do a contract with individuals. You need to be an entity. And so that's where Lifelong Learning to Find was born. And, and it was actually, you know, the name of the company is Lifelong Learning to Find. It's for a reason. Number one, I feel that I have defined for George my personal and professional learning and what it takes for me to grow. And so I actually wrote that down after reading Dr. Stephen R. Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, to write down what your mantra or, right? You know, like your thing. And so I wrote down lifelong learning to find, I have to find this. And so when it came time to form a company, I was like, huh, maybe since I figured this out on my own, I can help other educators if that's what they want, how to figure that out for themselves. And it really stems back to one of the administrators that I had um, was my boss. Her, her name is Dr. Ernestine Scott. And I had a, a major loss in my life in 2011. And it shook me so much that my colleagues at work knew. And she said to me, if your personal isn't right, your work is not going to be right. you got to get a handle on that. And so that inspired me to really learn about myself and, you know, understand that um, every person has emotional trauma and has things that they have to work on. And so I started there. And so it just married both. I don't, you know, it's a lot longer um, to explain, but all I can say it's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful, George. And, um, you know, today's conversation has just been very fruitful and, and joyous for me. And, you know, just really hearing you speak from the heart and taking, you know, that article and really <laughs> explaining it also in terms that are very relatable. And, you know, that's, that's a, also, you know, how you define a great teacher is taking something that's difficult and making it simple for everybody to understand. And I think today a lot of people are going to gain so much knowledge and so much insight 
due to the way you described this model. And we can all look back within ourselves and look back at things going on maybe within our current practice in the classroom and maybe, you know, even bring some light into that district practice as well. But at least we're all better informed and we're all better for it. And then we can kind of choose to see what we can change within ourselves to serve our students better, see what we can change within our classroom so we can serve ourselves better, you know, both professionally and personally, and then see what we may be able to suggest or bring to the table at the district level to start moving the needle forward and start changing some practices, finding out those things that aren't working or haven't been working. You know, oftentimes what I see is that many people are still, they're trying to solve 2022 problems with 2016 <laughs> strategies, and they keep doing the exact same thing, even though they know that it hasn't been working, but they just keep doing the same thing over and over again, and that it, it, it just hasn't been working. So, um, you know, this model, I'm definitely going to be sharing this in this episode. I know, I hopefully it will, I know it's going to get a lot of uh, listens, but thank you so much, George, for being here today and just really sharing this uh, from the heart. But before we end, though, uh, I you know, I have three questions you wanted me to answer. Yes, that's right. Right. Before we end, I always love to end with three questions. So I kind of go with kind of maybe a, a not so like still kind of like happy note, but, you know, speaking truth and being real. And then we kind of move on to, you know, just something a little bit more lighthearted. But first question that I always love to ask, based on what you've seen maybe in the last two years now, you know, obviously during pandemic and now as we are kind of coming back and or full on back into the classrooms, in the current state of education, what would you say is your current edu kryptonite? All right, so I'll be honest, I can't say I have one. And and the reason why is because I've read a book, um, it's called The Four Agreements. It's by Don Miguel Ruiz. And one of the agreements is don't take anything personal. And so, you know, don't take anything personal. It's not something you can just do. So I've been working on my emotional intelligence, my EQ, another book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0 is by Dr. Travis Bradbury and Gene Greaves. And I've been working on that since 2018 as a father and also as a teacher, as an educator. And so I've learned to really be in touch with my emotions and understand when I've had too much or when I can do more or, or when I can't. And so that is part of the recipe. The other part is the five steps to instructional innovation. I already know how to learn because I have a recipe for it. So if something is brand new to me, just follow the five steps. You go look at what's been done. Like, and I apply that in my personal life. Like, like you know, I was at the range this morning, right? I'm working on my license and I hired a coach. And so the, there's a framework there. And so I told the guy, just tell me what to do as far as steps. So the first thing is, is how you hold your hands, right? It's your breathing, you know? So before anything becomes a mindset, it's got to be a framework first. Just find what the research says. Look at the framework. If you need a coach, have them walk you through it. And then, and then you go from there. And so because I've worked on these two things for so many years, I don't really feel like there's anything that I can't learn, but I also don't feel like something is going to crush me because I don't have expectations and I try not to take anything personal. And if I feel like it does, I step back until I'm better. Amazing. Amazing. I'm left speechless. That is a wonderful answer. And thank you, George, also for, you know, sharing some of those resources as far as the books like, um, you know, you used and, you know, just some of those action steps. <laughs> I think that that's probably... I want to say that's the most unique answer that I've had so far. And I love it. It's very refreshing. I know. And because oftentimes, you know, that question is tough. And, you know, at that given time, we may see something like, oh, this is really weighing me down. Like the edgy talk, the learning loss, this and that and so on. Oh, well, but well, I, I will say this. What it used to be was anxiety, my own anxiety of being in a space and having to articulate what I'm, I'm, I'm doing. And so I realized that my anxiety was a result of fear. And so once I figured out what, 
were the steps that I took to, you know, conquer a fear in the past, like, you know, confronting a bully, then I just realized the emotion is the same, but situations might change. And what I have found is that preparation is the way to combat anxiety and fear. And so you have to, at some point in your life, and I learned this from Michael Jordan, you know, in Relentless by um, um, Tim Grover, he was Michael's coach and he was also in The Last Dance, you know, you have to reach a point that your preparation is something that can help you start to learn how to trust your inner voice or, or your intuition and also yourself as you move into new situations. It doesn't mean that you'll know what to do, but it means that you have the confidence to know that you'll figure it out. Great. Great answer, man. Thanks a lot. All right. Next question is, if you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? Lead with empathy and be kind. I think that, you know, based on a lot of the conversations I see on my timeline, whether it's politics, education, I, I, I think and even in relationships, I think that if we lead with empathy, meaning that we try to seek first to understand others before trying to be understood and to try to understand them, where they are coming from, not meaning that we agree with them or that we um, you know, bow down to them. Like I'm not saying that, but we try to understand why someone thinks or does what they do. If you lead with empathy and then you're kind, I think that a lot of the things that, that, you know, bother people about each other or about situations, I, I think we'll have a better point of view, you know, of how to, you know, get along with other people. And I think that that's really missing now and then. All right. Excellent. Great answer. And last but not least, my friend, from one fellow podcaster to another, let's say that this was your show and I was your guest. What would be one question you'd like to ask me? All right. So you said I'm a podcaster. So I have a podcast. And the reason why I have a podcast is because in 2022, every educator should have their blog. They should have a podcast, right? But I don't really, you know, consider myself a podcaster. I don't think that I have the talent that you have. So my question is this, bro. Where do you see your podcast in, in a couple of years? And I'm asking that because if Brene Brown can get 3 million followers on Instagram and have a Spotify podcast and have the podcast become a live studio show, why can't you? I mean, you're very hey. talented, very dynamic. So <laughs> what's up, bro? Hey, there, there's no, it, I'm working on that, man. See, that's a lot of, it's kind of goes back to what you're saying. You know, there, there's things that the people don't see that you're working on. And it's just one of those things you just kind of work in silence. And then at the end, it's just like, bam, there it is. And, you know, ultimately that would be the goal if I could, if I could right now, but it's going to take time, but I would eventually love to do something like that, you know, be able. And for me, it's just the passion that I have for education and what it's giving to me, I feel like because it's changed me personally and it's changed me professionally professionally, and it has given me so many great experiences and, and very similar to yourself where all of a sudden you, you, you're being recognized for things that for you you're doing because you're passionate about. It. And it's really things that you just think that, ah, eh, you know, uh, no big deal, but other people see that, wow, like they're doing these great things. I want to give back to that. And that's why I do the show. And I do the show because I want to bring in those passionate educators. I want to bring in those educators also that are doing great things that maybe don't even have a platform yet, or haven't even been asked because you know, we have so many great educators that are out there that are continually, you know, within the spotlight or really well known. 
But man, there's so many educators out there that are just doing some amazing things. And it's about the storytelling aspect. That's the way that I learn. That's the way we all learn. I mean, if you think back to the caveman era, you know, they're doing their drawings, they're, they're putting their stories up and they're learning from that. And for myself sitting here, listening to you and listening to guest after guest, I mean, it's just, I'm learning, I'm taking, I'm gleaning and adding it to my practice, adding that little zest and spice. And then, you know, it's going to come and it's going to happen. So it's just right, a matter so of right, so perseverance. All so, right. So it is May 21st, right? Yes. All right, so it's May 21st. I'm calling it out. I'm putting it into the universe. <laughs> so all the A&R people that are listening, that are watching, that are scouting the world for talent, Fonz at My Ed Tech Life needs to have his own show nationally syndicated. And I need to be the first guest on it because I'm the one that called it. So there you go, brother. It's in the universe All right. now. And there you go. <laughs> there you go, man. But thank you so much, George. I mean, you know, and, and this is what the, the, the thrill of it is, is just getting to know people. And again, we talked about this, uh, you know, recently this week. And I said, you know, people see that polished, finished product on social media, but they don't know the time the effort, the work that goes into just seeing that little 20 second clip, that 30 second clip, and it just looks so polished. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, again, making it relatable, but hearing your story and putting it out there for the world to see and get inspired. So I love it. So George, it's been amazing. I really thank you from the bottom of my heart, sincerely. You know, you're, I met you at TCEA your kindness to just come and sit right along me and just talk and hit it off the bat. And all of a sudden it's like, Hey, what's your number? Hey, here's my number. <laughs> and you know, the phone call on my birthday was awesome too. So I'm, <laughs> I'm letting you know right now that really made my day. So thank you so much for, for that, because that's, uh, you know, just, it, you're just a genuine humble guy that is hardworking and, you know, you really, you really are making an impact and moving the needle forward. And I thank you for your service and what you're doing for the education community, my friend. So God bless you. And I wish you the best as always, man. Thanks, my dude. And big shout out to TCEA. Big shout out. Big shout out. Um, I love them. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you. I appreciate John. I appreciate Luis and all of you that are going to be rewatching and re-listening to this episode. Thank you so much, as always, for making My Ed Tech Life what it is today. Please don't forget to check out our website at myedtech.life, myedtech.life. Check out our previous episodes. And guess what, guys? Summer conference season is around the corner. So why not get yourself some Maya Tech Life threads? You know, go to visit our store, get yourself a shirt, you know, just to lounge around the house or at your conference as well. Uh, also, go ahead and give us a review, guys. We're always looking to learn. Feedback is important to me. That way we can continue doing the best that we can and bring you the most amazing guests and the most amazing conversations for you to learn from. So as always, my friends, thank you so much. And until next time, don't forget, stay techie, my friends.